warm welcome to everyone and thank you for joining this Hardman & Co Investor Forum. My name is Keith Hiscock and I'm the Chief Executive of Hardman & Co. These forums give investors the chance to hear a company's investment case and question the management. Today we've got three companies presenting, followed by a talk from the economist uh, Sava Saveri. Our first presentation comes from BBGI. This is an investment company which owns infrastructure assets and collects revenue based on availability, not usage. It's got a market cap of 1.2 billion. It's got a yield of just under 5%. Uh, and we're very lucky to be joined today by uh, both of the co-chief executives, Duncan Ball and Frank Schrem. Gentlemen, over to you. Thank you, Keith, for the, uh, for the nice introduction. And uh, thanks and warm welcome also to everyone here on the call. Um, I will lead you to this, to this presentation, and uh, my name is Frank Schramm, and uh, together with um, Duncan Ball, I will present that. Um, BBGI, uh, Global Infrastructure, setting the scene of the different infrastructure asset classes. This gives an overview. Uh, this infrastructure excludes renewable energy because that's typically a separate asset class, and uh, that's the view of most actually analysts. Um, the different asset classes here covered are PPP, which is more generally also called availability-based assets, then actually um, regulated assets such as gas, electricity, or water transmission networks, coal roads, ports, and airports. Starting with the PPP asset class, the income stream comes from availability fees, which are long-term contracted and not subject to demand risk. As long as the hospital, fire stations, schools, uh, police stations, roads are made available to the public sector client, the client is obliged to pay the availability fee. This is the reason why operational PPP projects have experienced no marginal impacts from COVID-19. As the risk rates have reduced further um, in the last couple of years, this also had a positive impact on valuations. As discount rates are also coming down further, um, there's probably more upside in the market. Regulated assets is the second asset class here I want to cover. Um, the impact from COVID-19 was limited, but the pressure on valuation came from a different direction, the regulator. In the UK, the allowable returns have been significantly reduced over the last couple of years. Previously, it had been around 7%, and this had come down in the recent pricing rounds uh, and where the regulator set the new actual returns to around 4% for gas and water assets. This clearly had also a negative impact on valuations. On toll roads, traffic has reduced significantly. You may see that with your own actually our traveling patterns there, which have probably been reduced. And according to a recent PwC study, the negative on impact on valuation is about 10 to 20%. There's also severe uncertainty in the market for this asset class and how the future of, of traffic will be on the roads given the um, home office you know, trend. And, and, and current restrictions, but also future, future actually traffic patterns are quite unclear. Ports, um, again, PwC is that similar magnitude toll roads, about 10 to 20% reduction in traffic and also likely impact. Um, airports have been the most severely hit in valuations and still, could, still very early to understand the full, full impact on the sector um, if and when pre-COVID -pre traffic will be reached in the future. As we are investing in PVP and availability-based assets only, we believe we are well-placed in that environment. This slide presents the fundamentals of BBGI and our investment proposition. So what is our DNA? BBGI is a global infrastructure investor with a low-risk investment strategy, and we focus on delivering long-term sustainable returns. Our strategic pillars are low-risk, globally diversified, and internally managed. So strategic pillar low risk is based on our availability-based investment strategy, yeah, and we don't invest into demand risk or higher risk other asset classes like regulatory risks. Our revenues are coming from secure public sector or public sector backed counterparties, and the result is that cash flows are stable and predictable, and this helped us to deliver our progressive long-term dividend growth strategy. The global diversification pillar is based on our focused exposure to highly rated investment grade countries which provides stable and well-developed operating environments. We have a global portfolio that serves the society through supporting global communities. The third pillar is that we are internally managed. We, and that means Duncan, I, and the whole team are employed by the company yeah, and our interests are fully in line with that of investors. We focus on delivering shareholder value by being incentivized by shareholder returns and NAV per share growth. 
And important to note, it's not actually NAV growth, it's NAV per share growth. The quantitative benefit is that we offer a very competitive low ongoing charge below 1%. We have also consistently delivered our objective. Our analyzed share return is 10.6% um, and well above the 78% IRR target, which we actually had on our IPO pies. In total, the shareholder return since IPO is 136.2, which means if someone invested 100,000, know, the result would be in the 30th of June last year, 236,000. And we have received a strong or achieved a strong dividend cover of around 1.5 times, which is also not um, uh, the case in the wider market. This slide presents our robust operating model, which is focused on delivering sustainable returns over the long term. We have got three business principles, value-driven asset management, prudent financial management, and a selective acquisition strategy. Starting with the principle of value-driven asset management, which is our hands-on approach to preserve and wherever possible also to enhance the value of our assets. The NEV was 860 million uh, of June last year, and we will present our updated annual report end of March. And our portfolio is currently, we have added one more uh, PPP asset, 50 high quality PPP assets, and they performed very strong. Cash receipts were ahead of business plan, and we were very pleased to confirm you know, that the COVID-19 did not have any financial or materially material impact on our, on our, uh, on our operations. We also maintain the high level of asset availability of 99.8%, which helps to keep the customer satisfaction up. The second principle is prudent financial management. Since IPO, the dividend have grown progressively on average by 3.3% over the last eight and a half year, years, and our global portfolio has got some exposure to foreign exchange, and we have got a, good, a prudent hedging strategy in place, which aims to reduce our foreign exchange sensitivity. The five-year correlation and better uh, with the FTSE all share comparison is at 26% at 0.31, respectively, and we consider us largely uncorrelated to the wider equity market. The third operational principle is our selective acquisition strategy. We focus on availability-based assets only, and um, that's no style drift into other asset classes. And the, and the discipline approach has resulted in another creative additional following investments in the first half of the year of around 30 million. In the second half of the year, this is not yet year in because um, that's yet to be yet to be actually announced. There are, um, announced in our annual report, another 30, around 30 million. We have had an attractive global pipeline of availability assets in Europe, and North America, and Duncan will talk a bit later on our pipeline. This slide presents a projected cash flow from our portfolio. The chart presents our long-term stable and predictable cash flow resulting from our portfolio. We had strong cash receipts around 40 million from our investments in the first half of 2020. And as a reminder, the cash flows come from public sector or public sector by counterparties and the contracted nature of the long-term cash flows increase the predictability. The cash flows are also positively correlated to inflation with inflation link of, of around 0.5%. This slide presents our dividend growth and the development of the ongoing charge since IPO. At IPO, we promised a progressive dividend policy, and we think we delivered on this promise. Over the last eight and a half years, we have increased our dividends on average by 3.3% per year, and the dividend for 2020 was 7.18, and for 2021, the guidance is 7.33 pence per share. The chart on the right-hand side shows the development of our ongoing charge, or the expense ratio, as was previously called, uh, and since IPO, we significantly reduced our expense ratio to currently around 0.9%. This clearly also demonstrates the benefit of our internal management structure as we have got the lowest ongoing charge in our peer group. Presents the four key strengths of the portfolio. On the top, you see two boring but important facts. We invested 100% availability assets. And secondly, more than 99% of our portfolio by value is operational which means we have a low risk portfolio. On the bottom left, you see that we're truly global. We currently have 36% of our portfolio in Canada and UK is the second largest geography with 30% followed by Australia, continent, Europe and the US. All assets are located in stable, well-developed AAA or AA rated countries. The chart bottom right demonstrates our focus on availability roads and bridges, which make up 50% of the portfolio 
We believe that being focused on roads and bridges is good as they are simpler and easier to operate and therefore involve less risk. Other sectors are school, justice and health. At this point, I will hand over to Duncan, who will lead you through the second part of our presentation. Thanks, Frank. Um, perhaps I can uh, go to slide uh, the responsible investment. There we go. Um, I just want to talk for a moment on responsible investments. We talk a little bit about the assets we have in our portfolio. We're very, very proud of the assets we have in our portfolio. We consider ourselves stewards of critical infrastructure with a strong social purpose, and we take this job very seriously. We serve a multitude of stakeholders, uh, including our investors, our employees, our partners, the communities we serve, and of course, our government clients. We have 11 healthcare projects in three countries with over 2,000 beds, serving more than 1.8 million patients per annum. Um, now more than ever uh, with COVID-19, we're very happy of our involvement in delivering critical health care. Um, our 34 schools provide a safe and inspirational learning environment for over 38,000 students. Our transportation projects uh, reduce journey times and provide safer travel for more than two, or, or 240 million uh, travelers per annum. And finally, we have uh, four police stations and 10 fire stations that collectively serve 2.6 million people. I'll just talk about some of the progress we made during 2020 uh, in the areas of responsible investment. We formalized our ESG and corporate governance efforts. Uh, we've strengthened our focus on climate change mitigation. We're proud to be a signatory of the, both the UN PRI, Principles of Responsible Investment, and the UN Global Compact. We are a supporter of the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related uh, Financial Disclosure. And we recently received a, a rating of A from the uh, United Nations uh, Principles of Responsible Investment. We will publish a, a standalone ESG report uh, at the same time, uh, more or less, as our annual report in March. And uh, we will be compliant with the new SFDR regulations that relate to sustainability for EU companies. If we go to the valuation, um, I, it, like to sort of tell you a little bit about how we value the assets in our portfolio. We use a discounted cash flow evaluation approach and, and the valuation is independently verified uh, by an independent valuation firm and of course by our auditors. The weighted average discount rate within our portfolio is 7.03%. The individual assets range from a discount rate of 6.25 to 9%. Um, and I think the, the key takeaway from this chart is to show the attractive pickup over the risk-free rates. Um, if you look at UK gilts right now, they're uh, a 10 years 46 basis points and a 30 years 1.05 uh, basis points. Our portfolio, when you look at the, the countries we're in and the, and the assets we have, uh, the, the average pickup over the risk-free rate is 6.2%. Uh, so we think in this low rate environment, our assets offer uh, you know, a very attractive uh, uh, investment thesis. The discount rates in the secondary market remain very competitive. There's been a lot of demand for these, this type of uh, infrastructure asset and uh, it's pushing up the values. That makes it um, challenging to acquire new assets, but we've been successful in doing so on a disciplined basis. And finally, um, we believe our valuation is prudent and conservative. And as I say at the start, it's been independently uh, validated by a third party. I can talk a little bit about our pipeline. Uh, we're fortunate to have a very strong pipeline of opportunities, both in the primary and the secondary. Uh, primary is where we bid for new projects um, directly with governments. Secondary is where we acquire projects that have already been um, built um, we have a, a formal pipeline in place with a, a contracting firm in, in North America that will give us uh, the opportunity to acquire five, five assets uh, that may come uh, up for sale in, in coming years. And we're also tracking a number of um, primary and secondary opportunities. So there's no, no concern about the uh, opportunities that lie in front of us. We have a 180 million pound credit facility. Um, so we're, we have lots of dry powder to pursue those opportunities. And the, the, the overarching theme is many of the construction contractors that we work with, they've seen their balance sheets stressed by COVID. 
So they are selling assets and we have been active in, in acquiring assets and we, we expect that trend to continue through 2021. The other trend is that um, we're expecting governments to use infrastructure spending as a stimulus to kickstart the economy. So we believe we're, we're well positioned uh, to continue to grow prudently as, as we have in the past. Just to conclude the presentation in these changing times, we're very confident of our low risk, uh, highly resilient portfolio. We're delivering critical infrastructure. So roads, schools, justice facilities, healthcare facilities, all with a strong social purpose. All these assets are availability based. Um, we're paid by strong government counterparties with, with high credit ratings. Um, and in an environment where uh, a, a number of companies have faced challenges, where dividends have been cut, we're, we're very confident of our dividend coverage and um, the prospects we have for the future. We deliver a strong social purpose. We're committed to strong asset management. And um, with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your time and uh, open it up for any questions uh, that, that may come out. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, we're going to move on to the Q&A session now, which will last for uh, 10 minutes, and then there will be a poll after that. So we've got a number of questions here. Let's start with this one. Could Duncan explain how BBGI influenced the operators of the assets and secure the impressive ECG credentials? E.g., do BBGI have, for example, green leases in place? What are the other plans for net zero? Uh, it's a great question, very topical. Um, we, it, it's interesting when you talk about how we run these uh, health healthcare and schools and educational projects, um, there's this concept of operational control. Where we have a hospital, we can't go in and tell the hospital that they should lower the temperature by two degrees and that would, so we, we have to work within the constraints of our contracts. But what we have been able to do is be more, to identify the, you know, it's, it's more, it's rather than implement, it's influence is the, is the key word. We work with the clients, we influence them, we uh, make them aware of the savings that could be available through some of these initiatives. Um, it, sometimes it's within our bailiwick, we can, we can do it. We've replaced a lot of LED lightings on our roads to reduce our carbon footprint. But I, I, with, with most of the assets, it's working closely with clients to influence them. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, disclosures, we're working, we've engaged a third party consultant to help us track our scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And we're hoping to use that information over the course of this year, um, get up to speed. And then um, I think the, the last part of the question was our plans for net zero. Once we have that information, we, we do plan to make a, um, a statement about net zero. Okay, so um, just following on from that question from Simon, he says, could you please um, illustrate your investment process by talking how you acquired one of your recent assets? You could use the Bridge Over St. Lawrence in Canada as an example. Frank, do you want to take that one? Sure, yeah. Um, it, the Bridge Over St. Lawrence was, was actually, um, it's, a, it's a great showcase for us. Yeah. Um, we have got good contacts in the industry yeah, and the seller was Hochtief, which is a German construction company, but with a large presence, PPP presence in Canada. Um, and um, they came out with the idea of selling that one, uh, that project, they've got a 25% interest. Uh, and we checked that and it's, it's in the transport sector. It was over, it was about 30 years uh, uh, concession period. Um, it has been built, so it's operational. So it has been materially de-risked. Um, it has some inflation linkage. So from the pre-screening, it is very much in the core of our investments, of our of our what, what, what we do. And it's 100% availability and the client is a triple A rated client. So um, you can't get more in terms of uh, ticking the box what's required as, as to be a good asset. Um, then actually the, the uh, whole team set up a, a process, a competitive process, um, and uh, they, they asked uh, a number of bidders to provide an indicative bid. Uh, we put in a bit, we were ranked among the first, first three, as we understand. Uh, and then actually we had, um, we were asked to start due diligence or all three were asked, asked to start due diligence. And uh, we knew that actually the co-shareholder we had a preemption right would not preempt. So we, we actually gave Cortif the comfort we would start and, and 
the due diligence, which is typically costly, yeah, and actually uh, had an advantage for over over the other bidders probably who didn't want to start the due diligence process. And we were very quick and completed the due diligence within four weeks and signed, an, signed the sales and purchase agreement and transferred. Um, it's also good to say that we have got strong relationship with Octave, which also helped to, to have got a smooth uh, due diligence process. Um, the information were, were, uh, were um, provided in a very timely manner and very efficiently. And we're very proud of that investment. And it's a creative investment um, and it's very much fits in our in our portfolio. I hope that you. answers the question. Yeah, I think you have. Thank you very much. So um, question from Alan, uh, what index linkage is there on projects, e.g. CPI in the UK, what indices are used? Maybe I'll take that one. Um, so we have a, a global portfolio in it, it, it's generally linked to inflation, about 50 basis points of linkage for a 100 basis point increase in inflation. Um, it varies by region in, in the UK, it's RPI. In other um, parts of the world, it's, it's uh, the equivalent of CPI. Some of our roads have specific baskets that protect us against things like uh, labor rates, diesel prices and, and bitumen prices because that's used in asphalt resurfacing for, for highways. But it's, it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's um, across the portfolio, it's about 50 basis points of linkage. Okay, I've um, got a question. Um, you're a CCAV. Could you just explain a bit more about why you're a CCAV based in Luxembourg? From an investor point of view, what benefits does that give me? Okay, um, the, a CCAV um, is basically just, just uh, the form, the form actually, uh, the, the form under the, um, the UCITS here. Um, so what, first of all, why are we are in Luxembourg? Um, we, we actually, the, the, previous, the previous company where we acquired our seed portfolio had a presence in Luxembourg and it's quite easy for us to take that over, you know, to, to take over the office um, and actually be, be actually located in Luxembourg. Um, a lot of our peers here in, in the sector, uh, even though they might be in Guernsey or Jersey or somewhere in the UK, they all go through Luxembourg here. Yeah? And then actually I've got to have got a company in Luxembourg and then actually they, they go on with the other jurisdiction. So we thought why actually adding another jurisdiction here yeah, above the Luxembourg structure, yeah, which actually adds another risk. Yeah? So we ended up saying this is Luxembourg and stop here. Um, and the CCAF, the benefit of that is that, uh, um, which is typical for usage, you know, that you don't pay taxes on, on the profits uh, you make on the Luxembourg level. That's the same actually in the Netherlands, same in Switzerland, you know, there's no different. You know, so we, but to be, to be clear, we pay taxes, each underlying project company pays taxes in its jurisdiction, but we don't pay additional taxes on our dividends or the distributions we receive in Luxembourg. Okay, thank you very much. I've got a, a couple of financial questions. Um, and then a question about shareholders, which I'll try to get through in the next four minutes. Um, so you're obviously trading at, at a very large premium to book. What control do you actually have over maintaining that level? Um, the second question, which I'll blend into this one, is that your dividend cover is, um, is way above your peer group, about 1.6 percent, about 1.6 times roughly. Um, does that mean BBGI investors should expect higher dividend growth in the future? So it's a, from a, a total return basis, looking at those two questions. So maybe I'll uh, try to answer them both quickly. Um, in terms of the premium, and then I'll talk about the uh, dividend cover. In terms of the premium, I think we've, we IPO'd in 2011 and we've always uh, traded at a premium, save for a, a couple of days in, in March uh, during the COVID crisis when, when all bets were off, but we quickly returned to a premium. The question is, why are we trading at a premium? I think it's it relates to the fact that we're paid by AA and AAA rated governments. Typically, we have a 7.33p uh, uh, dividend plan for 2021, and on a current share price of 172, that's that equates to about a 4.25% dividend yield, and that has been in an environment where you know gilts or 10-year gilts are 46 basis points and. 30 year gilts are just, just over 1%. So it's a nice pickup over. And then I think the other thing that has um, helped us there uh, justify the premium is that we've consistently had NAV uh, growth. We've never had a, a regression in NAV. Um, 
we're not subject to power prices or other things that can can erode NAV like other uh, other infrastructure funds have been. So I think it's this you know it's our ability to continue to distribute capital and um, the 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 stability of our cash flows that you know, these are highly contractual cash flows. So so that gives people comfort and that's that's why the premium and it's been it's been pretty consistent over the years. With respect to the dividend cover, the information we're sharing today is our mid-year results, which every mid-year it's it's a little higher in mid-year just because of the timing of the cash flows, because not all these projects um, pay out at the same time. But you know we're pretty comfortable. We have about a 1.3 times dividend cover consistently over the year, and. Um, you know, we, we've conservatively managed the, the portfolio. We've been able to grow the dividends and we expect to do so in the, in the future. You know, there, there are others that don't have the same dividend cover. I can't comment on that, but we, you know, our, our portfolio is, is conservatively valued, conservatively geared. Um, there's a the quick question from Edward. He said, does your shareholder register change over time? So maybe you can answer that very quickly. As we are listed on the long stock exchange and have got our, um, a healthy liquidity on the long stock exchange, which is also uh, what, what people expect as, as a listed company, the shareholder structure has changed over time. Um, but uh, it's probably fair to say that we have a, a couple of cornerstone shareholders uh, which uh, have been in since the start, uh, they have supported us since the IPO and have grown also with our uh, over the last couple of years, over the last eight and a half years, nine years, uh, with our capital raises. Uh, but okay, uh, thank you very um, much. Uh, give me a list of company that uh, the shared register has changed over time. Fine, does we're just literally out of time. Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. We've just got one quick question because we're actually out of time. Um, in responding to Brexit, this is from Nicholas. When does your status under the FCA's temporary permissions regime expire? I think it expires in two or three years. You know, I don't. I would have looked up the exact date. You know, but um, um, it, it's a great question. Uh, we're not worried. You know, if, if that if that is if that is the question, if, it, if that keeps us awake, the answer is no. Because UK wants obviously is very very much interested to keep actually its financial centre and to keep companies listening on the London Stock Exchange. So we expect that is a no-brainer that we get an extension, you know, but it's also not, not a question which, which is worrying us. Thank you very much, uh, Frank and Duncan. Uh, so the second company presenting today, or fund presenting today, is Tritax Eurobox. This is a, an investment company quoted in London that gives investors exposure to continental European logistics, real estate assets, i.e. warehouses. It's got a market cap of £440 million, pounds, a very popular sector at the moment. And uh, we're very lucky to be joined by the fund manager, Nick Preston. Nick, over to you. Right. Thank you very much, Keith. Yes, thank you for that introduction. And um, let me just um, start off my, my brief presentation to you by, by um, just providing a very brief snapshot and building on those few words you've just uh, said, Keith. Um, as you say, Tritax Eurobox is, uh, is a premium listing on the London Stock Exchange. We are an investment trust um, structured to invest in real estate assets across continental um, Europe. Um, and by that, we really focus on Western continental Europe, the developed markets and big population centres. I'll come, come along in a minute about a little bit more about our investment approach and how and the type of assets we actually buy. Um, now we IPO'd two and a half years ago um, in July 2018. Um, and while we do have a, a strong focus on income, the market in which we are operating at the moment, as, as you said, Keith, it's a very exciting, fast moving and growing dynamic market at the moment. We are um, adjusting focus slightly to more of a value add approach through asset management initiatives, innovative acquisitions to be able to take advantage of this dynamic market and delivering returns to our shareholders. Um, over the last two and a half years, we've built up a, a stable performing portfolio 
of prime logistics assets, as I said, across Western continental Europe. Um, key attributes, and I'll come on to a little bit more detail about this later on, is that these properties that we buy are let on generally long leases to high quality tenants in, in very strong locations. And we, um, as ever with any real estate investment, are looking at the income generating capabilities of these properties to be able to pass on to our investors a high progressive dividend. They have to bear in mind that um, across continental European um, um, and investments, you always get indexation. And so we are, our um, rent is indexed to local CPI drivers across all markets. We invest in prime locations, always close to populations where customers are located for, for the occupiers and also workforce, but also infrastructure to allow, um, allow access for goods in and out of the properties. We're always keen to buy modern, flexible and sustainable assets. I'll come on later to talk about ESG and sustainability, but it is a critical part of future proofing our portfolio to make sure that the assets that we invest in um, are fit for purpose for the long term. And that means having very strong ESG credentials. Um, the market conditions, and Keith, you touched on this at the beginning, are highly supportive at the moment. You will have all read in the newspapers, I'm sure, and seen, uh, seen uh, in the media generally, that the logistics market is, is something that has been changing very rapidly. Now, a lot of this, um, this impact and, and these changes have been in place and happening for quite a, quite a long time. There was growth of, of um, growth of this through digitalization, automation that allows supply chains to become more efficient and simple. And then that, then that couples in with the growth of online retailing, which needs that technology to be able to operate. And so online retailing is a real driver and one of the, the, the most important uh, facets of the logistics market across Europe. And, and it's worth saying that, that in the UK, the online retail uh, penetration is around about 20% of all the um, retail spend. And pre, this is pre-COVID. And in Europe, it was around half that. And so we see that there are real opportunities. There always have been real opportunities in Europe for, um, for that to catch up as, as the European um, online retailing market um, really continues to grow. And, so, and that is one of the key, um, the key uh, characteristics which we see across um, our market. The, there are other impacts which have also been around for a while, but have also all been accelerated also by the COVID pandemic. And this is more onshoring, more stockpiling, holding inventory closer to users, and, and a movement from, you will have heard that the, the jargon used in the logistics industry from uh, just in time, which was all these very thin, long, thin supply chains with manufacturers in the Far East and, and delivering just in time to uh, facilities in Western Europe. That is now changing. We're now seeing a change to a just in case supply strategy, whereby there's holding more inventory closer to uh, either the end users or whether those be manufacturers or customers. And so that is all leading. All of this leads to increased demand for an ever scarcer asset and the, the occupiers are looking to lease these properties um, and I'll come on to talk about supply and demand in a moment. Um, all of this basically puts the fundamentals of the European logistics market in a very very good place for us as long-term investors and allows us to be very confident about long-term sustainable returns to our shareholders, delivering long-term sustainable returns to our shareholders um, into the future. Um, just a very quick snapshot, I won't go into too much detail here in terms of the operational highlights, and I've got a, a map later of where our assets are actually located. But we have a portfolio valuation of just under 900 million euros. We hold 13 assets in six countries, 22 tenants, and that comprises just under a million square meters of logistics space. Um, we tend to have quite long leases, just under nine years. I've mentioned the indexation before, um, and, and all of these assets are income producing, which enable us to uh, pay a dividend. Now, the market in, in, in which we're operating, and as I, this I touched on a moment ago, in terms of the supply demand dynamics, which are some of the fundamentals for uh, performance in real estate markets, 
Are we looking at where the tenant demand is coming from in terms of who is going to lease these properties? And then we also look at the supply side of things and say, are new buildings being built? Are buildings available? What are the vacancy levels right, like? Now, from a demand side, leasing in these markets remains very strong. Um, and the absorption is the take up of space by tenants and that has been continuing to grow. And you can see that uh, the, the graph here on page five on the left hand side that uh, the first half of 2020 saw strong growth and that has continued. And we're just getting uh, figures through in the last few days demonstrating that 2020, despite the COVID pandemic, um, was it was a very similar to similar levels to 2019. And as I said before, a lot of this, the drivers of this is coming from e-commerce. And these are the European um, growth you can see here in um, online spending. And we expect this growth to really con continue to rise. We, we, we understand that during the COVID pandemic, we saw across Europe, the um, online retail spending uh, increase by around 50%. Um, and while all that won't stick because people will return to shops, it will have given a lot of people who were not familiar with online retailing a taste for it. And so a lot of that will uh, retain. And all of this leading to further demand for uh, these well-located properties uh, that don't have to fulfill these um, online shopping orders to do what the, the online retailers need, which is to have a huge stock of products be able to deliver, be delivered quickly and cheaply to customers. And um, looking now at supply side of things, the vacancy levels in the key markets are very low. And I would just, just, just take a step back and go, everybody says to me, oh, well, across Europe, there's so much land. I drive around Europe and there's just loads of land. You can build these properties anywhere. And I go, yes, there is an abundant supply of development land in Europe, but it is not in the locations where the occupiers want to be. In those locations where occupiers want to be, there is a real scarcity of land. There's continuing pressure from both the green lobby and planning restrictions against new development, and in particular, development of very large buildings. And we're talking here, the buildings that we buy are up to a million, if not more than a million square feet, 100,000 square meters, a million square feet. These are huge buildings, and therefore there's a natural resistance from um, communities and local authorities to um, zone and let these things be built. That scarcity is value to us because we, we own these, we, we selectively acquire these and we see the values go up. Um, and it's worth saying that, that uh, the combined effect, and this is this chart here on the bottom left hand side, the combined effect of the strong demand and the limited supply means vacancy levels go down and the immediate effect of that as vacancy levels go down, then rents go up. And that is illustrated here. Let me move on um, to talk in a little bit more detail about some of the specifics of our portfolio rather than the wider market. Um, I apologize for this chart, it's a little bit dense, but I, I, I like to use it because it's, it's, I think it's a very strong message. This is a population density map on which the black spots have been put, which are our properties. And um, you can see that, as I said earlier, that what we're doing when we select um, um, investments is to invest in locations where there is high population density. That means land is scarce and it also means there's a lot of customers nearby, which is in particular for the online retailing um, industry, what they need. So we're buying close to these major conurbations, densely populated areas. The infrastructure has to be strong. That's one reason why uh, we like Benelux and the western part of Germany. It is near the major um, European ports of Hamburg, Bremerhaven, um, Rotterdam, Antwerp, etc. Um, but also it's where the population density is in Europe. And you can see that area. There are an awful lot of people live around there. Um, the, a final more, more technical point is about power and data. These buildings are generally large, new and able to accommodate automation. That automation, the machinery, requires enormous amounts of electricity and it also has to have a very robust data connection onto to, to the uh, broadband and onto the internet to be able to, um, to manage these systems. And so those are other restrictions that we need to be um, careful about in terms of selecting these properties. So it's all about simplicity because we buy a building not just for its lettability during the lease that we 
you know, we buy when we invest, but also beyond that, it's over the life of the building. These buildings, because they are simple, they have very low obsolescence, and therefore their um, life span is very, very long, much longer than the immediate lease. Hence, we need to buy assets that are ubiquitous, simple, and able to be let to a wide range of tenants. And that's why we go for the good locations um, with good road connections, good port connections, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some characteristics, and I won't dwell on these for too long. Um, we have, we're, we're well spread across Europe. Our buildings are modern. Um, it comes to the sustainability point. Uh, most of them have been built in the last few years. They are large, nearly half our assets are over 100,000 square meters in total. Our income is very well diversified. We have a wide range of different occupiers. Um, and we have a spread of lease expiries in terms of when those, those leases fall in. And um, <coughs> we have most of our income is, as I said, is over five years of, of unexpired term. Uh, but we do also have some shorter leases, which enable us to capture the growing uh, rents we're seeing in our market. And then on top of that, and the point that I made earlier, is that virtually all of our leases are subject to indexation to local CPIs, to which, which is on an annual basis, which just uh, gently grows our income stream going forward. Um, ESG, that, as I said at the beginning, is, is, a, is a critical part of our, of our DNA, really. And we have set some, um, some, some targets for the, for the short to medium term, but also longer term targets. And they're all around four key areas of owning healthy and sustainable buildings, reducing um, emissions, so that, that's uh, less uh, reliance on fossil fuels for carbon emissions, lower energy usage and, and reducing costs for our occupiers in these buildings, but also nature and well-being. This is something that's come out of COVID. It's all about quality workspaces and, 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 um, and, 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 and looking after employees and biodiversity helps in there as well. But then linked in with that is also the socioeconomic impact and how these buildings interact with local communities. Um, strategic um, a strategy and the strategic issues. Um, we have very successfully executed our strategy to date, built up a very high quality portfolio, which was doing exactly what we wanted it to do. As the market has got, um, uh, has, has become more dynamic and faster moving um, and more expensive because of, um, of, of increased interest and, and money being allocated to the logistics sector, you know, we've had to be more creative and innovative in accessing, um, accessing new opportunities in order to be, to be able to uh, continue to, to produce the returns to our investors. So we have refined our investment focus based on the stability of our existing portfolio to be able to, um, to capture value. And this is through entering into um, investments slightly earlier in the development cycle um, to be able to capture um, rising rent and um, more, more um, uh, uh, effectively buying cheaper yields than, than in the past. We're also adopting a more active capital um, allocation policy of recycling assets where we believe that there are better opportunities elsewhere. And so that is crystallizing profits and, um, and um, delivering returns to our investors that way. Um, I talk about value creation in terms of, and I've put a few photos up here, apologies they're a little bit small, but I think just give you a couple of examples of what we actually do. We're not just buying very dry uh, properties and assets where there's, there's little activity. We can add, uh, use our management expertise to um, add further value. We have a property in Barcelona where we're in the process of building a large 88,000 meter um, square meter extension. Um, that provides a yield on cost of around 7.1%, which compares very favorably to market yields of around 4.5%. Um, we're also building in Belgium on a plot of land. Um, and this is another um, 15,000 square meter new building there. You can see that picture of the second one down on the left, some um, diggers on site and that was taken just before Christmas and that's moving ahead now. Um, also, another example of how we add value, we buy in a more innovative way. And this is what I talked about a moment ago, 
um, through buying the land in advance, but all pre-let and with a construction contract in place, we're able to get much more advantageous pricing um, through those type of, of acquisition structures. And that property in Wunstorf, which is near Hanover in Germany, has also got a 10,000 square meter extension uh, plot immediately next to it, pre-planned, which will allow us to further drive value in the future. We also buy, and the final one here is in Breda in the Southern Netherlands. Um, and this was an asset we bought 50% let to Abbott Pharmaceutical Group, 50% with a rent guarantee we can, from the developer we bought from. We controlled the leasing of that. And just demonstrating the point I was making earlier about rents are actually growing in these markets. We were able to lease the um, second half of this building to Samsung at level 6% above the Abbott lease. Um, and so that gives you an idea of some of the, um, the initiatives that we, uh, we are carrying out across the portfolio to drive the value for our shareholders. Just to wrap up now, and, um, and you know, we've been delivering robust, strong returns for our investors and fully expect this to continue for a long time to come. The European logistics sector is set very well. There are, there are a lot of, of significant structural changes as I've mentioned before in terms of, of online retailing and how that is changing and the way that the, the retail is being fulfilled. And that is going to provide a fundamental underpinning of demand for a long time to come, which when coupled with restrained supply, we believe will give, will um, you know, points to very strong performance for a long time to come. Today, we have a very strong balance sheet. You know, we are as a company fully deployed. Um, our strategy, I think, has proved to be very relevant and, um, and able to adapt and, and, and grow as the market does. Um, all of this is underpinned. This is not some kind of risky strategy. You know, we have a resilience here um, through not only our balance sheet, but the income generated from these assets. Um, and that is what underpins the returns. And what we can do is for having bought the right properties in the right locations, continue to add value and drive returns for our investors. A lot of that comes from our experience, but our, and our partners across Europe who are, um, are working with us on these. And all of this with the tailwinds, as I've said, of the, the logistics sector generally. So I think that that really looking forward that, that COVID, all COVID has really done is accelerated these effects that were in place already. And, um, and we've just seen a compression of timing on this. And so we, we we're fully expecting these, these impacts to happen. They've just now been brought forward much sooner. This has been fully recognized in the investment market. We are seeing ever increasing demand from all types of investors to uh, get into the investment into the uh, logistics investment market, which we believe will further compress yields in the future, um, as people acknowledge the potential that this sector has. And so, you know, we're able to, um, to capture this through our existing portfolio, but also um, new opportunities through um, asset management development partners that we have embedded in Europe, which gives us exclusive access to very high quality assets for the future enabling us to continue to deliver the sustainable returns that um, we have done to date. Um, Keith, that wraps my presentation up. Thank you very much. And, and perhaps hand over, actually, Richard, you're dealing with the uh, q and A, I I believe. Uh, uh, yes, I am. I am. So um, let's, uh, just give me a second, and let's start with a fundamental question. So I think we're going to be talking about your company. I think we ought to, you ought to put Big Box into context because of your relationship. And we're also going to be talking a little bit about Aberdeen Standard and the Aberdeen Standard European Logistics Fund yes. as well. Um, but let's start off with a basic question. Um, has your experience in the UK with Big Box um, helped in continental Europe, or is the market very different? Um, it has helped a lot, and let's just be clear to those who aren't 100% clear, these are two totally separate companies but run by the same manager, it's Tritax Management, and so I run Tritax Eurobox, which is completely separate to Tritax Big Box REIT. Yes, you're right, Richard, there are similarities. Occupiers in these properties tend to be large multinational companies, and therefore we have overlap of, of occupier, um, obviously in different jurisdictions. However, I would also say that there are lots and lots of differences between Europe and UK. Um, I would say the UK market is, um, is a very transparent market, very heavily researched, and um, there's a lot more 
uh, less fragmented. The European market is, is much, much bigger, obviously. Um, it's more fragmented. Every country is different, despite the, the EU being the EU. They have separate tax and legal systems that adds a degree of complexity to that. But also there are a lot more micro markets to access. There's also all sorts of technical things about the lease structures are all different and planning and zoning and, and all of that type of thing. But fundamentally, the supply and demand is the same. As I mentioned before, there is a lag in Europe uh, on the um, online retail penetration, which is much more advanced in the UK, which we see is will grow across Europe. And Amazon, as we all know, you, you may well, you may not know, but across Europe, they are growing very, very rapidly from a really quite a low base unlike in UK where they've been operating for really quite a long time, we see that as they expand, the online retailing expands and that is gonna further push our market, which is lagging the UK, the European market, lagging the UK quite considerably. Okay, thank you for that. So the next question comes from Phil, it's about your tenant concentration. So your top three tenants are 44% of the business at the moment. Um, the largest of which is Mango, which is 19%, which um, is a fashion retailer. Yep. Um, whereas Amazon is your second biggest um, client, and that's obviously a much more diversified business. Does, man, does it worry you that your largest tenant is a fashion retailer or not? Um, it is something we keep a very close eye on, but knowing Mango as well as we do, and we know them extremely well and have access to, they're a private company, and therefore there's very little uh, publicly released uh, information about about them, but we do get um, exclusive access to their um, their financials. They are trading extremely well. Um, they have met, they have really, I think, been a brilliant example of how retailers should and could and move to the omni-channel world in terms of this shift from just physical stores to a combination of physical stores and a very sophisticated um, social media and online presence coupled with um, a very um, a market leading highly automated distribution channel which actually is, is located within our property in Barcelona and they told us that they're expecting their EBITDA um, in 2020 to be broadly speaking the same as it was in 2019 entirely pre-COVID which I think illustrates the point that if a company like that where it's had a huge number of its shops globally closed during the year can in, can the, the, what they've done is they've caught up by um, by the online sales that is what has, has balanced out the fall in the in-store um, uh, sales but I think the other point in terms of giving us reassurance from an investment perspective the Barcelona market is one of the most undersupplied in um, in Europe there's virtually no supply of uh, large logistic space in that market. Uh, and also we have benefit of up to a three year bank and, and rental guarantee on the property. Should the worst happen and Mango fail, which I fundamentally do not believe will happen, we will then have a three year period, which is covered by guarantees um, to um, release this property in, as I've just said, a very, very strong logistics market um, in, in Barcelona. So, yes, it is something we can pay a lot of attention to, but actually, um, I personally am very reassured um, by uh, all everything about it. OK, thank you for that. So we've got a question from Max that sort of um, leads on to Big Box versus um, uh, your business and Eurobox. And um, the question is this, Big Box's share price is at a small premium to NAV, but Eurobox is at a discount, a substantial discount. But both companies collect 100% of their rent, both have largely inflation proof con um, contracts, they have similar gearing, length of leases. Um, it's not logical why there is this difference. So is Tritax um, Eurobox um, too expensive, sorry, is a big box too expensive or, or Eurobox too cheap? Have you any comments? Yeah, my first comment is that we're actually trading about NAV at the moment. So right. um, I think that's I think that number is wrong. Yes, okay. right, yeah. <laughs> that's the context of the question slightly out of kilter. But um, I think that as a there's a ge more general point here that we are trading, let's say, around um, the IFRS NAV. Um, there are an awful lot of the of our peer group who are trading at significant premiums to um, uh, to NAV and that does ask a question I think that 
we as a company, I'll be honest here, have suffered a number of, of, of large institutional investors um, having to sell out for liquidity reasons, uh, becoming more risk averse over the last 12 months. That has caused um, a number, you know, a suppression in the share price. But I think what this does um, is really, I think that it can, as a, as a selling point um, to investors, will say, well, the, the, the fundamentals of our portfolio, the markets we're in, and the quality of our assets is such that, as you just said, with 100% with rent collection, um, very strong financially strong tenants, that there's no reason for that. And that at some point that, that, uh, that the market will acknowledge that and that we, we should be trading at a premium, which is really what um, the market you know, understands. I think what the, the, even the direct real estate market understands in terms of some of the pricing that we've seen in um, the, you know, the yields being paid in, for direct assets about the growth potential uh, within our market. So uh, there's a, a sort of wider fundamental point there. Okay, so a very quick question. What percentage of rents are basically are currently overdue? Zero. Okay, next question then. Um, Tritax is over, just over 40% geared. Um, how will fur further expansion be funded? And that comes from Alan. Um, a number of sources. Um, we, as I said in the, the presentation, we are looking at um, at capital recycling, which is a euphemism for selling some uh, some of our uh, you know assets which have delivered returns already and reinvesting. Um, at some point in the future, when the board feels it's right um, for investors, we will look to expand the company. Um, we can't we can't say any more on that at the moment. And um, but when the time is right, um, an equity raise would be appropriate. Uh, to capture the the opportunities we have out there. Okay, um, a very quick question, which is probably quite difficult to answer, but there's a lot of commentary on tax leakage and legislative changes for online retailers. Yep. Do you have any comments on that part, on that front? Um, in a brief way, yes. I think you know ultimately those will get passed on to the customers of the retailers. Uh, I think a, a key point is that the rent on these properties that these in terms of the rent the overall rent on these logistics assets as a percentage of the total logistics cost for these operators is somewhere below one percent it is a tiny fraction of their cost base okay so uh, i do do i think that it will that any increase in in tax uh, you know online retail tax is like is very unlikely to impact on the rent that these occupiers are able to pay us, and the supply-demand dynamics in the, um, in the in the property market, in the real estate markets that we invest in, are likely to lead to strong rental growth, which won't be impacted by um, any tax issues um, at, at a higher level. Okay, um, so just we're moving towards the end here. We've been had a number of questions about Aberdeen Standard and its investment in in the parent tritax yep. um, and a number of questions about the asl funds yep. um, as well um, i'm sure you can't answer this question but from a strategic point of view are you able to make any comment about the relationship um, that you have as a business uh, at a parent level with aberdeen standard or not um the deal hasn't finally closed yet we're still awaiting regulatory approval however the plan is once it does that Tritax as a business will be um, autonomous from the main Aberdeen um, entity. Um, however, I would say, and I'm, I suspect this is the, where these questions are coming from, is to the uh, what are the future prospects for both Tritax, Eurobox and Aceli, which are operating in broadly the same space with similar strategies. Uh, my answer to that is it's still too early to say, other than it is a very obvious question um, to ask and I know that both boards are considering this and ultimately you know we are the manager the boards are the ones who will make decisions on um, on anything here um, and they are considering this and will be considering it in due course I strongly suspect that will be that, that this will take some time that that um, the, the the acquisition of Tritax just needs to bed down and the boards will sound out what investors views are um, and be, be analysing the pros and cons of, of, and there's an awful lot of complexity around this, as you can imagine. But it, it's too early to say yet is the first answer. However, it is an obvious question to answer 
level. I can't really say any more than that at the moment. Okay, so um, we've got a number of questions about obviously the long the leases are linked to uh, linked to CPI, yeah. but you are able, or some companies are able to um, put in additional services to increase the, the value their value. So, for example, um, what about solar installations on roof and, and other sort of green? Uh, um, initiatives you can undertake that are beneficial not only to the society and the economy but also to the company to get your your rate of return exactly higher than the CPI. Yeah well it, that's less a CPI point it's more of just a total return driver in terms yeah. of providing us with future income. We have a program in place at the moment that our head of sustainability is going around every single one of our assets that does not have um, or is at least not who is not 100% covered by solar panels and looking to expand and grow into that because it, it's a very obvious thing to do. Um, different countries have different rules in terms of tariffs and goodness knows what, it's all very complicated, but we are looking and we're our property in Pina near Hanover, we are just embarking on that at the moment. The Barcelona extension that I mentioned, we'd be putting solar panels on the roof there. Um, it's something that we are doing, we're rolling out um, not only from an ESG perspective, but also from a plain commercial perspective, it does make money for us and for our investors. And so it's a good thing to do on lots of different fronts. Okay, so we now have a question about funding the growth of the business and the involvement of private shareholders as opposed to institutional placings. So do you have a comment on how you're going to um, involve private investors with expanding your shareholder register in future, or are you going to be largely um, dominated by core institutional shareholders? Um, we like both. We like institutional shareholders. We like the uh, retail shareholders. It's a hypothetical question at the moment because we've got no plans and nothing to say on that at the moment. However, as I said, you know, we fully appreciate the position of retail um, shareholders within our book. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, I would not, you know, would not look to exclude them. They, they, they represent a decent proportion of our share, shareholders at the moment. Um, and it would be short sighted of us to ignore them in the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thank you for that presentation from Tritex Eurobox. And thank you, Richard, for the questions. Uh, we're scheduled now to go to uh, Bill Morgan, who is the CFO of uh, Anglo Asia. I'm not big introduction. Uh, it's a leading copper and gold producer in Azerbaijan with a range of assets from exploration through to full production. Uh, the group's profitable, pays regular dividends to its shareholders, it's got a market cap of just under £200 million. And as I said, we're lucky to have with us today Bill Morgan, who is a CFO. Bill, over to you. OK, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks for inviting me, Keith. OK, this is just a quick introduction to the company. Anglo-Asian is the only listed international mining company in Azerbaijan. The only other significant mining company in Azerbaijan is Azagold, who are government owned. The company was floated on AIM in 2005, and we poured our first gold in 2009. Uh, to the end of last year, we have produced almost 700,000 ounces of gold, 1.3 million ounces of silver, and over 13,000 tonnes of copper. Uh, we acquired our six concessions in Azerbaijan in 1997, and of these, uh, three were restored to us last year following the resolution of the conflict with Armenia. Uh, we currently produce gold and copper and silver at a Gedebek site from an open pit mine and two underground mines. Our production facilities include leaching and flotation, and these are also located at Gedebek. In total, including the 9,000 square kilometers restored last year, our concessions in total are just under 2,000 square kilometers. I mean, to put this into context, this is approximately 2.5% of the territory of Azerbaijan. Okay, we are a very well positioned company in Azerbaijan. Reza Vaziri, our president and CEO, is a long established businessman here, and he is supported by a very experienced board and management team. And it goes without saying that we have excellent relations with the government of Azerbaijan. Our financial position is very strong and we have a very well-defined growth strategy, both to increase production in the medium term and for the company's long-term development. Last year, we produced just over 69,000 gold equivalent ounces of metal, and we are expecting to produce around the same level this year. 
It is our firm intention to grow this in the next few years, and we have ample opportunity to do so. Uh, these are our three operational contract areas, as we now call them. The current heart of the business is a Gedebeck contract area, where we produce gold dory and copper concentrate from an open pit and two underground mines. We have a wide range of processing facilities, including leaching and flotation. Our company broker, John Mayer, recently said that we can process just about anything. And frankly, he was not wrong. We also have a small mine at Gosha, which is 50 kilometers from Gedebeck. All three territories have excellent exploration potential as they are situated on the Tethian tectonic belt. Uh, this is a little bit about our financial performance. The company has performed financially very strongly over the last five years. Cash generation has been excellent with net debt of 49 million US dollars at the end of 2015, transformed into cash of 39 million at the end of last year. Turnover and profits have both been rising and we started paying dividends in 2018. For the year to the 31st of December, 2020, we have already declared six US cents per share of dividends, but that does not include any final dividend. The company also has the simplest possible capital structure. We have 114 million ordinary shares in issue with no warrants or options outstanding. Current market cap is around 130, sorry, 183 to 185 million pounds sterling. Uh, of the capital, the directors and management own around about 42% of the share capital. Um, very rarely, uh, and possibly even uniquely for an aim-listed mining company, there have been no equity fundraisings or material equity dilution uh, since the flotation, okay? The, comp the company has several opportunities, uh, both to increase production in the medium term and for the longer term development of the business. We're in the third year of a three-year exploration program at Gedebeck, Gosha and Orderbad. We have already made several discoveries, which we are fast tracking into production. We're also looking to start production from the restored territories as soon as we can get access to these mines. Longer term, as well as exploiting our considerable existing contract areas, we're also looking to obtain new concessions in Azerbaijan. We also have ambitions to develop a project outside of Azerbaijan and to become a multi-jurisdictional miner and we're currently negotiating a joint venture with Conroy Gold for a project in Ireland, okay? This slide um, gives a lot of detail about the current exploration uh, targets and program at the Gedebeck contract area. Uh, Gedebeck hosts uh, a large number of exploration uh, targets and we are currently focusing on four areas of exploration. These are all within 10 kilometers of the processing facilities, which means this is very good when we come to develop them into mines. The closest is actually only 1.5 kilometers away from the processing facilities. Um, the areas of uh, current exploration are all known to hold host gold, gold copper and polymetallic gold copper and zinc mineralization. Um, regarding the mining type, uh, the geometry of the deposit of Avshanti 1 uh, potentially allows for open pit development while we're expecting that Gilar, Ugor Deep and Zafir are likely to be underground mines. Um, drilling work is planned this year at all four areas. However, priority will be given to have Shankly 1 due to the near surface mineralization and Zafir because of the very uh, thick mineral thickness that we've seen. Uh, these all have fast track development potential. The company has previously demonstrated its ability to fast track developments when it started mining from Ugol only 18 months after its discovery. Uh, we can bring mines very quickly uh, into development because no additional permitting is required uh, in our territory. Okay, this is uh, some information about Zaffa, which is a, a new discovery, which we recently announced. It was discovered by ZTEM Geophysics, which was a helicopter survey carried out at the end of 2019. The ZSEM survey identified many epithermal and potential porphyry style targets, and Zafir is one of them. 
Uh, Follow-up drilling is given a significant mineral intersection of 130 meters, uh, half a percent copper, 1.7 grams per tonne of gold. With maximum grades in drilling so far of up to 6% copper, 15% zinc and over 12 grams of gold. Um, given the grades and the thickness of the mineralization, we think the potential of zaffir is, is, is very significant. Uh, importantly, zaffir is only 1.5 kilometers from the company's processing plants. So no new major infrastructure will be required to develop the mine, which we, as I said, would be expecting to be underground. Uh, Zafir also sits on the trend uh, from the Gedebeck open pit mine to the UV deposit. It's given the minimal thickness and potential grade, this is a, a high priority target. Okay, this is again a lot of information about Gosha. Uh, Gosha is some 50 kilometers from Gedebeck and is the location of a small narrow vein underground mine. Uh, exploration has identified a new gold vein system beneath and adjacent to the current mine. The gold grades returned are very significant, and we have also discovered copper mineralization elsewhere in Gosha. Uh, drilling will be carried out at targets near the existing underground mine and in other areas of the contract area during uh, this current year. This is Ordabad in the Natiavan enclave of Azerbaijan. Ordabad has a very large mineral potential based not only on Soviet era exploration, but also from results of company exploration, which has identified both copper deposits and gold vein targets. Um, exploration was limited last year as access was curtailed due to COVID-19. However, uh, drilling and ground-based geophysics is planned this year, and we'll be working very closely with the Azeri government and in collaboration with the Natural History Museum in London, who have a team which specializes in porphyry deposits. Okay, this uh, is a map of, of Azerbaijan, which shows all six of the company's contract areas, including the three newly restored contract areas of Sutali, Kizil Bulag, and Vejnali. Um, given that we have nearly 2,000 square kilometers of land under concession, and all of this land contains mines and known deposits, we feel the potential of this land is therefore pretty enormous. Okay, this is the first of the restored contract areas, Sutali. Uh, this hosts the largest gold and silver mine in the Caucasus region, known as Soidulu. This was formerly known by its Armenian name of Zot and is reported to host over 8 million ounces of gold. The mine straddles the Armenian Azeri border and 73% of the mine is actually located in Azerbaijan. It has been reported that re recently that 120 ounce, 120,000 ounces of gold was mined from this mine uh, per annum. Uh, the Azerbaijan government has started to build regional infrastructure and construction of a road from northwest Azerbaijan has already started. This will open up the, the area which is mountainous. The company will evaluate the mine with formal permission to access the site is given by the government of Azerbaijan. And we're also compiling a, a database about this mine. Okay, this is Kizil Bulag in, in Karabakh and Bejnali in Zangilan. Uh, Kizil Bulag uh, hosts a substantial mine which is producing copper and molybdenum known as a cash end mine. It's reported to contain 275,000 tons of copper. Uh, there is also significant processing infrastructure by the mine. Vijnali is the most southerly of the contract areas and is located in the Zangilan region of Azerbaijan. It is known to host the Vijnali copper deposit. However, the extent of historical mining of the deposit is unknown. Uh, we're looking forward to accessing Vejnali in the near future. It is located in the strategically important Zangilan region. A transport corridor through Armenia has been agreed between Armenia and Azerbaijan, linking the Zangilan region to Nakhivan. This will provide road and a possible rail access to the deposits of Ordabad, and is likely to have significant positive impact on the potential development of the region. Um, although everyone has been focusing on the potential of the existing mines within the newly restored contract areas, um, we also feel that there is very significant uh, 
exploration potential within these newly restored contact areas. The geology of the region indicates that this will keep us in work for, for many years to come. The company also has ambitions to grow outside of Azerbaijan and has been assessing opportunities in various countries. We are currently negotiating a, a joint venture agreement with Conroy Gold, and we believe this is a very attractive project. Uh, the negotiations have been going on since last May, and frankly, that's a lot longer than we would have liked. It's also given rise to much speculation uh, about the delay. However, I cannot say any more as the company is under duty of confidentiality in relation to the discussion with Conroy. Okay, and this is our final slide, and this is just a, a summary of the uh, investment case for Asian mining. Well, we believe that the company is extremely well placed to grow from its current status into a mid-tier mining group. Um, the current production provides a cash flow to finance the growth, and we have uh, many opportunities, especially in the restored territories, which was frankly a transformational event for us. We have exploration assets delivering positive results. You know, we can quickly start up mines. Um, we're looking at other external opportunities. We really think that taken together, that um, this really will give us the opportunity to grow. And as well as all these opportunities, obviously we do have the people and, and the capital to be able to pursue these as well. So we think the investment case speaks for itself and look forward to continue to deliver shareholder value as we have done for the, for the past few years. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your time in listening to this presentation. Well, Bill, thank you very much indeed. That was extremely comprehensive coverage. And I will tell you that during the course of your presentation, you managed to cover an awful lot of the questions that had come in. <laughs> but we're gonna, we're gonna have a go at trying to find out a few more angles. Um, this is from Patrick. He says, some time ago, there was a news release about law firms being instructed to examine the valuation of the company with a view to, possible, to possibilities of, of merging or selling the business. Has there been any progress? This was, sorry, you were breaking up a bit, but this was a news release about what? Us being sold as a company? Um, it would seem to be from this question that that's exactly what it says, but I'm not aware of this background, are you? Okay, no, there was some talk, I think two years ago, that the Azerbaijan government had appointed some lawyers in Azerbaijan with a view to actually acquiring either the company or some of our exploration uh, areas and, and such like. But um, there have been no developments. And as far as I'm aware, and we're all aware that that has all gone away. So, um, you know, I have to be careful what I say here, but uh, I don't think there's any intention of the government of Azerbaijan to, to do anything with this at the moment, other than help us uh, develop what we have. Okay, well, let's move on to um, the questions of cost. So we've had a couple of questions about break even price levels for each metal, each metal relative to indices. And also, um, what is the all in cost of the gold and silver production that comes from Josh? Um, I think our last all in gold production, all in sustaining cost of gold production was uh, just below $600 per ounce. Um, a large majority of our costs are actually fixed, so our all in sustaining cost tends to go up and down with our production. Um, but we are looking at, I would say, around about $600 per ounce as normally sustaining costs. And we feel, or we don't feel, we know that that is a, a very low cost for the industry. This is because Azerbaijan is a, a very uh, low cost jurisdiction and we've got excellent infrastructure. So for instance, we get electricity from the grid, which is very cheap. We don't have to uh, generate our own electricity, which a lot of mines do and spend a lot of money on diesel, for instance. Okay. So um, here comes a question about um, long-term copper production strategy. So I'm just gonna read this question to you. This comes from Paul. Uh, how would you describe your long-term copper production strategy in the context of your region and pending EV opportunities? The market is giving your company no valuation for Armenian assets. How do you think this could change in the future? Well, there's two questions there. First of all, I think there is a question about 
what is our strategy with regard to copper? I mean, copper is becoming an increasingly uh, important metal in the world. And I think it's becoming an increasingly important part of our production. If you look at our production over the last few years, we are producing uh, more copper. And given the types of deposits that we're looking at, I think that is a trend that we would expect at least to continue and probably increase slightly. Um, regarding the valuation that the market is placing on our, you know, three, three newly restored contract areas, um, I can't really comment on that, but I th think that obviously once we actually start to demonstrate that we can do something with these contract areas, I think then the market value really will come through. So I think the moment we start actually mining or doing anything in these contract areas, rather than saying we're waiting for access, that is when I think the market will really start uh, appreciating what uh, what a transformational event this has been. Um, you talked about the Conroy Gold venture in Ireland, which you obviously can't say a huge amount about, but why would you be interested in, with all the other opportunities you have, why would you be interested in yet another additional opportunity? What was the catalyst for that? Okay, we have a big ambition to be a multi-jurisdictional miner. Um, and that could affect our share price in a very beneficial way. And I think it demonstrates to the world that we really are not just a little local Azari outfit, but you know, you know, we have got the potential and the ability to be an international mining company. Um, so that is the rationale for actually doing something outside of Azerbaijan. Uh, the Conroy Gold um, project, we just feel is a, a potentially very good project in a very nice jurisdiction. Ireland is part of the EU. It's got a well-defined mining industry and it's something that we feel we could pursue. Um, when we look at projects, I think we look at the jurisdiction there in probably more than actually the project itself because you know that is so important now in, uh, in mining. There's no point going into a country with a fabulous project if you know the government's going to take it away from you the moment you've developed it. It's, has been known to happen. Right, so the next question basically is, could you, could you um, repeat the capital expenditure plans that you have over the next 12 months for the company, please? Capital expenditure for this, well, on our existing mines at Gedebeck and uh, Gosha and Alderbad, um, we do not have big capital expenditure plans because these are mature operations mm -hmm. and that comes along quite nicely. Obviously, there's a bit of replacement capex, but we're not talking, you know, tens and twenties of millions of dollars, you know. We're talking single digit millions of dollars. Um, obviously, if we can do something in the restored territories, that may add to our capital expenditure plans. Um, but what it would add, we don't know until we know what we're on. Thank you very much indeed, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Bill and Richard, for uh, for that session. So we come to our final presenter, who is uh, Savas Saveri. Savas is the chief economist at Tosca Fund, which is a leading hedge fund. Uh, Savas trained, uh, trained as an economist at the London School of Economics and has been in the city since 1991. The last 12 years of which have been spent at Tosca. He's well known for having occasionally um, interesting and differentiated views. Savas. Over to you. Thank you very much, Keith. And I had the pleasure of working with you. I'm going to deal entirely with economics, focus on the UK. And I'm not desensitized to the fact that this virus has wrought some very serious medical and monetary harm to, to families across the UK. Having said that, I've got to deal in aggregates. And the reality is that in aggregate, the UK has seen, or rather the households across the UK have in total seen a huge increase in savings because as their incomes have for the most part been underwritten by furlough schemes, in other cases by a boost to activity because large tracts of the economy have actually been stimulated by the behavioural changes that COVID has wrought. So you've got, um, a positive there and also a restriction on what we can spend so we estimate that by the time this lockdown this third lockdown comes to an end UK households would have accumulated something in the region of 300 billion of excess savings uh, to put into context uh, these, these numbers are uh, 
shouldn't be seen as controversial. The Bank of England uh, chief economist, Andy Haldane, mentioned that in uh, a, an article that he uh, gave, or an interview he gave to the, the Mail on Sunday, that he, he thought that there was a hundred billion of excess savings at the end of the second lockdown. So we're assuming that, that uh, the run rate continues. Uh, now, let me make perfectly clear. I'm not evangelizing about the UK. I, I honestly think that the, the UK economy will come out of this crisis incredibly strongly and robustly. Um, and I'll make two, point, two caveats to that. One is that that enforced saving that we're seeing in the UK has been in, most part, in, in large part denied incomes across large tracts of Eurozone club med. Just imagine the, um, the hollowed out incomes across the Mediterranean from Portugal down to Spain, into France, Italy, Greece, Croatia, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Malta. The economies that rely upon tourism for, in many cases, about a quarter of direct employment and a quarter of GDP have actually lost not simply one year, last year's hard currency earnings, but will most likely lose this year's as well. And these are countries that came into this crisis with, um, in many ways, a weakened, weakened fundamental economies in very much the same way that COVID has been most dangerous to human beings with pre-existing conditions. So the same applies to economies. So comparatively speaking, the views I'm expressing for the UK should not be interpreted as being views that can be extended to Europe. In many ways, the prognosis for club mid Eurozone bear in mind that includes a number of large Eurozone economies because you've got France, Italy, and Spain. That will basically uh, have ramifications for Northern Europe. It's true that Germans and Swedes and Dutch not traveling south on holiday have denied Southern Europe incomes, but those incomes in Southern Europe have been recycled back to Northern Europe because the Southern Europeans will have surpluses in tourism, but deficits in trade because they go and buy consumer capital goods made in Sweden and Germany and Holland and Belgium. So that, that will ricochet backwards and forwards. In the UK, we are net travellers. We have a deficit of £40 billion pounds a year in tourism. And in many cases, that money has seen itself already um, in the form of staycationing. Another point I need to make, a sec second caveat. So the first caveat is, the UK is unique in the sense that, and I'm not being intensive in saying this, the UK economy has had, by and large, a good crisis in terms of its fundamentals. So the second thing is that had COVID struck in any year other than 2020, any year between 2008 and 2019, there were forces in the UK that would have meant that my prognosis would have been much different. Think about 2008. Uh, the crisis that we're seeing today, uh, we've seen for almost a year now, has been compared with 2008. They're incomparable. 2008 was a, a crisis which was profoundly fundamental and avoidable. You had over leveraged banks, property prices were overinflated, the pound was, was too strong. You had lots and lots of uh, a confluence of forces that, that, that created the, the 2007, 2008, 2009 crisis, quantitative easing followed. Thereafter, what happened was that you had an economy in the UK that between 2008 and arguably 2013, 2014 had underlying problems. It, unemployment was not as it was coming into this crisis, uh, barely 4%. It was hovering 8% 8 until really 2013, 14. Guilt yields had responded badly to the, the banking failure. So the guilt yields, which came into the, this crisis close to zero in real terms, back in the post-2008 period up to 2014, where it was with 5%. You also had other issues over that period. You had inflation that had responded badly. So between 2008 and 2013, 2014, the UK economy could never have withstood the COVID crisis. Thereafter, unemployment began to fall. The economy began to recover. Guilt yields began to fall. You had banks were 
much more macro prudential because the Bank of England demanded they were. But then what happened in 2015-16 was that you had the shock election of David Cameron without unencumbered by the Lib Dems. That then triggered uncertainty concerning an EU referendum. Then comes June 2016 and we have the, the result that we know shocked capital markets in the UK. And then from 2016 until 2019, the UK was beset, despite having unemployment that was historically practically zero, because under 4% uh, unemployment is seen by most economists as being zero in, in to all intents and purposes. Anything below, anything below 3.8 starts to create uh, problems with the uh, wage inflation. So what you had in 2016, 17, 18 and 19 was a political crisis in the UK. Uh, had the COVID crisis struck in February, March of 2019, February, March of 2018, 2017, Parliament was in crisis. You had a Tory party that had to deal with an ever decreasing minority as MPs defected. Come the 12th of December of 2019, that political uncertainty was, was shockingly ended and we entered 220 expecting the UK to really deal with Brexit, but also deal with it in a way that you had a coherent political voice in Westminster. So the point I need to emphasize is that had this crisis struck the UK between 208 and 2019, it would not be in a position that it is today to deal with it so robustly, emerging from it. And also the way that this crisis has struck the UK is unique to the UK. You can't extrapolate conclusions for the UK into any part of Europe, including Northern Europe, including Germany, this big mercantilist economy that really needs a healthy Southern Europe to buy its consumer, to, to buy its capital goods and consumer goods. Just to give you an idea, this, this is sort of a, these bullet points attempt to really to, to bring home in, in, in just a handful of ways why this is not 208. In fact, it's not any proof. I, I'm into my 30th year of working in commercial finance. So the, I've studied the UK economy since I was 17. I've uh, taught economics and I've practiced economics in commercial finance. No two recessions are the same. This is technically a recession. You can't deny that because GDP has been falling and there's been a hit to the market. The issue here is that this is existential. This is not a structural recession that we had in the 70s and into the 80s. It's not a housing-led recession that we had in 89. Again, like to away, perfectly avoidable, but uh, brought about because we had really politically reckless hands on the tiller of the housing market. The, the UK now is, is really much managed out of Trade Needle Street. The Bank of England is back in good governor of the hands. I think whatever you think about Andrew Bailey as a, the FCA, he's been a good, good central bank governor. Back in 2008, you were, we were lucky we had Mervyn King. Uh, but also we've got a very good chancellor this time around. I, I, he may prove me wrong, but thus far, Rishi Shunak has been exceptional. And we're lucky again, a month before this crisis struck, he was effectively thrust into number 11 because Javid was kicked out. I don't think Javid would have been remotely as good a chancellor as Sunak has proven. Imagine again, just how the good fortune of the UK was that we haven't got McDonald or this sort of uh, conflict. Had, had the election gone differently, we would have had what would have been called a government of national union. Imagine dealing with this crisis, you, however incompetent or competent you think this Tory government has been. Imagine a government of national unity where you've got, you had Labour alongside Plaid Cymru with the SNP, Lib Dems, all pulling in different directions. Uh, you would have seen effectively what we've seen un unfolding across the European Union. So just give you an idea, this is, the, the bars reflect since 2000, savings at the household level. These are fig official figures from the ONS. The red line is, is unemployment. So you get the idea that when the 
uh, 08 crisis happened, you had a big increase in unemployment, joblessness because of the shocks of the financial, so financial sector, a, a material increase in household savings, ratio, uh, savings ratios because of uh, uh, the impact or the hit to confidence, jobs confidence. Then we had the referendum. What we've had recently then are these big, big blowouts in, in forced saving, which cumulatively will amount to about a third of a trillion pounds of enforced household savings. It won't all go into GDP, goods and services, it will go into asset prices, property prices. If that goes, it, this goes back to my point about this being a really unusual recession, in as much as the residential market hasn't been boosted because of stamp duty being suspended. It's been helped by that, but really it's because householders are sitting on, in aggregate, there are ex exceptions sadly, sitting on considerable amounts of enforced savings, which sitting at home with their computers, they can look around for potential house moves, property moves. And that really brings me to another point. So I, one of the reasons why I've got a very, very, very uh, strong conviction that unemployment will spike, but then come down very quickly, is because the UK is unique. This is, let me sort of spend a moment with this, these, these graphics. The red line, on the left is a reflection on the number of workers involved in go to old consumer sectors, pubs, restaurants, bars, even indeed gyms, because people increasingly began to use their homes as their sort of gyms with Peloton. The blue line shows the number of workers in, across the UK in come to consumer, consumer sectors. Because as much as we think that the the cloud is a destroyer of jobs. Ordering something from the clouds still has to be delivered with boots on the ground. In fact, what you see here is that from 2013, the number of workers in come to consumer grew and grew and grew. Much more labor intensive to think about the, the time when the FTSE 250 had four dairy companies, because delivery that we know today, sort of this bespoke time slotted delivery, everything used to happen just for milk and bread. And we had Dairy Crest, we had Express, we had Unigate, uh, uh, Robert Wiseman. Well, this time around, what used to be a very sort of um, narrow product, sort of unrefined delivery system has now been very much refined and it's very labor intensive. The graph on the right shows in red, the growth rate, the anemic growth rate in in retailing in the UK if it's measured by go-to. So these are the, the problem with the red line is that it, it, it picked up the diet and the death of the high street and shopping centers. The blue line by contrast, which matches the blue line on the left, is the growth, the, the, the compound growth rate of 15% in internet retailing. Things come into your door and to repeat, it's incredibly labor intensive from the warehousing all the way through the supply chain to your front door. Having a tin of baked beans delivered to your front door involves more labor being employed than you going to a grocer's to go to Sainsbury's or Audi to pick up those beans. Again, that's the myth that has been played out uh, ad nauseum about technology destroying jobs. It does not destroy jobs. It creates a completely new industry makeup, which is even more labor intensive than what it's replacing. Uh, am I arguing that these jobs are high value added? No, of course not. But the jobs being lost here are for the most part of a, of a nature that the skills can be transferred to, to here. Okay, like it or not, it's a like for like job. This is not job destruction that we saw before where you had highly skilled manual men in shipyards and steel mills and coal mines losing their work and having no alternative often being, well, invariably being the heads of households, the only earner. Invariably in regions for which that industry was the core driver of secondary and tertiary sectors. This time around, not one part of the UK has been in any way uh, disproportionately hit by this crisis because there are pubs and bars and restaurants and leisure centers and arenas all over the country. This is, not a, this is a thin widespread shock that will bounce back quickly. So returning back to the graph on the right, just before this crisis struck, it appeared that the rate of growth in, in internet penetration, I call it 
um, peak RIP. It appeared in November of 2019, December of 2019, January, indeed February of 2020, that the growth rate of the internet in terms of invading retail spending had peaked, peak retail internet penetration. And then this crisis struck and you saw the growth rate of what we consume through the internet going up. Now, the UK is unique in this regard. What you have on the left is the same line that we saw before uh, captured by uh, the growth rate. So what this graph does, it shows you how much of the internet accounts for retailing. Now, it appeared that we were peaking at 20% at the close of last year. Then you have this huge spike here, almost certainly we're gonna be here. Look at the rest of Europe, look at Southern Europe. Even the US, the home of Amazon, has less pervasive internet penetration than the UK does. Why does this matter? It means it matters because some of the activity that we were denied in go to retailing has been captured in this very labor intensive spike in come to retailing. And again, to repeat, as much as we've seen workers lose their jobs, we've seen a huge increase of bifurcation in the UK economy in the form of dramatic job creation across the supply chains that feed this growth here. Now that's been absent across Europe. So not only these Southern European, these, these Mediterranean club med Euro economies been denied tourism from the UK and from Sweden, from Germany. They haven't had the internal mechanism to capture lost consumption as households have been locked down. And also, as we know, sadly, that whereas the Chancellor in the UK was able to respond very quickly with a furlough scheme, and some business support schemes, because of this, the, the singularity of the European Union and the sluggishness of moving 27 economies as one, you haven't seen that support across Europe. And I don't think that we have yet seen just how damning this crisis has been fundamentally for the, the large tracts of the Eurozone. What the Eurozone does not need at the moment is to have matters made worse. And the way that uh, things are going, just as in 208, the Bank of England acted very quickly, but the ECB acted slowly. Bank of England cut interest rates dramatically, engaged in QE back in 208. It took years before the ECB did both of those things. And if you act too late, it's too late. Just moving through a few other themes here. The red line here is old fashioned finance in the UK, sort of moving sideways, it'll go down. But the blue line is the way that you can't have e-commerce without fintech. And the UK has enjoyed a huge increase in employment in fintech. This is number of workers in fintech in the UK, again, using official data, and this is a combined. Going forward, I have no doubt that in shifting even more of us into e-commerce and e-finance, job creation will be uh, driven all the more. And as these countries across Europe have to embrace e-commerce and e-finance, they're going to look to London to provide the software to drive that. So these, these are, again, this is a going back to this, 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 this sort of one third of a trillion pounds of excess saving in the UK that I can't emphasize enough is going to be the catalyst, the, the, the oil that fuels the UK recovery to create, as I mentioned, what effectively will be a short, sharp spike in unemployment. Uh, my PhD is in labor economics. Um, and as such, I studied it firsthand, really, when you had a UK economy in the 80s, which saw, saw GDP begin to recover in, in 81, but unemployment not peak until 1985-6. And that was because of structural uh, mismatches in the UK. Uh, which do not exist today because of the painful supply side reforms that were embarked upon in the 1980s, continuing into the, into the 1990s and have continued even more into, into the, this, this millennium. So just to, just to summarize and to repeat, if you can use the word luck in any context, dealing with a pandemic, I'll use it here in the sense that the UK was very lucky. It was, it was struck by this cursed virus 
in 220 and not any year before then, back to 208 and before. We're lucky that we're being hit by in the UK with a strong alternative economy in many ways. The, the internet and all of its affiliates is to me as a entirely new economy which creates jobs. If you look at the, the data from the Recruitment and the Employment Confederation, they, they show you just how bifurcated the UK is in terms of incredible demand for, for um, to recruit in sectors that have been expanding because of the pandemic. And of course, sectors that have been locked down, seeing a collapse in recruitment. We've also seen, as we know, uh, in the region of 1.4 million Europeans who were hitherto in the UK, returning back to Poland and Lithuania and Estonia and Bulgaria and France and Greece. The idea that they won't come back is absurd. They will come back once the jobs that they formerly did are once again available to them. And that's the thing is that we're not avoiding going to destinations that involve leisure or recreation. We've been denied the access to these, these things. And when the access is allowed us again, we're going to return using the saving that we have accumulated. And the jobs that were once there are going to be returned. This is not like shipyard, shipyards closing down or still more closing down. If you lock down, a coal mine is permanent. It was because of a structural change in the global landscape. Closing down a stadium, an arena, a restaurant or a bar is purely temporary. So this recession is entirely frictional and not structural. So uh, quite a lot going on there. Uh, I'm more than happy to take questions and um, thank you for your time. Okay, Savas, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think the most um, popular question is, if you were Rishi, what would you be doing now? Because obviously people are thinking about tax rises, they're thinking obviously about employment, which you've covered, but you know the structural changes in the way the workforce is, is employed, which is what you've partly addressed. And I think it moves on into um, other questions we've been having on, what does this mean for offices? What does it mean for shopping centres? What does it mean for all the structural side of the economy that has probably been at a tipping point now that we probably well we obviously didn't realize it was going to happen so um what's your general take if you're rishi now and you've got a two or three year view what are you going to do well, that's a very good you make the point just now about a two or three year view this country does not will not face an election until december 2024 so this is a really a great time to be doing adventurous revolutionary fiscal changes and I have no doubt that he will respond to the the in a, the disequity or inequality in 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 taxation, corporate taxation. So he'll, it, there will be an Amazon tax, or call it a um, a sales tax on the internet. Uh, it will be absorbed into margins. It won't be inflationary. I have no doubt that he will announce at some point very soon a very generous cash crackage scheme to kickstart those. Uh, car factories that are very heavily centred in the Midlands and the north and north northwest and northeast of, of, of England. So, um, and in terms of how he funds it, let's let's be perfectly honest here. The the UK has gone from being an, a bank that would pay its depositors an interest rate, which is positive, to being a safety deposit vault. Gilt yields in real terms are negative. The world is giving us their money to say. And asking in return for less than they gave it gave us it's that form of protection so he can he can spend effectively money that isn't being magically produced by a money, money, money tree but global savings looking to deploy out of dollars why is that unique because it's the first time in my experience that guilt yields in the uk have been negative in real terms imitating switzerland so car scrappage scheme both economically uh, sensible and environmentally sensible uh, sales tax, eminently sensible. Otherwise, the economy has enough dry tinder not to need to be overstimulated. I haven't even touched upon the fact that uh, I, I have no doubt that I'm categorical on this. That at some point be between now and the end of the year, the pound will have gapped up to one point. As capital markets realise how fruit matters are across the eurozone, and as the ECB is expected to cut rates below zero, the pound will start to move. From where it is against the euro 114 to 130 which is disinflationary it will move up against the dollar as well 
as capital arrives into the UK, responding to its favourable status. So, um, yes, the Chancellor could mess things up. No, he has shown no signs of being in any way negligent thus far. So we've had another question, just to reiterate, do you consider the current le levels of debt in, in the country, which is corporate debt, household debt, um, does it, government debt, does it worry you to any extent that the economy is, is misbalanced, is out of balance? Well, again, if the question is, it, am I concerned about quantitative easing? Let's do the counterfactual. Suppose that the Bank of England did not perform quantitative easing in 2008. Let's, let's be honest. Quantitative easing happened back in 2008, and it stopped in 2013. It was, it was restarted, I think, wrongly by Mark Carney after the referendum result. I think Mark Carney had a sort of a hero syndrome. He had got the, the, the Brexit thing wrong. We voted to leave. He then cuts interest rates and then bucks on, on QE. For no reason, the economy didn't show any signs of responding badly to that. Uh, this QE program that we've restarted has been dramatic, but incredibly sens sensible. Uh, the, to, at the moment, the Bank of England is sitting on about £750 billion pounds worth of accumulated gilt, principally. Am I concerned about the exit from that? Am I concerned about a taper tantrum? No, because in many ways, the global appetite for gilt is such that the Bank of England like it or not, since it began buying gilts, the Bank of England has created a huge book profit for us because it bought gilts at far higher yields. These gilts have been maturing. The, the Bank of England has basically gifted the maturing gilts to the Treasury to write them off. It's been receiving coupons on the gilts, which has been gifted to the Treasury or the Exchequer. This is not the QE that we saw in Japan or in the US where the money left the country. It went in, in search of yield. The QE performed in the UK, stayed within the UK, recycled, recapitalized the UK. So it's, uh, it often frustra it frustrates me a lot when QE programs are compared as if they're equivalents. They're different. The Japanese QE program and the American QE program, the ECB QE program were very unique in their own ways. And so too was the UK one. And to repeat, in the UK, money never, never left. With the ECB, the QE money went into peripheral Europe. It went to Poland and Romania, Bulgaria, into Sweden. So uh, I, I'm, not be, I'm not being blithe about the, um, the scale of the QE. I'm just grateful it happened. And think about the alternative that had it not happened. We'd be eating dirt now. So we've got a third of a billion, sorry, a third of a trillion of excess savings, roughly. I think it's what you mentioned. Um, so that can either get either be spent or it can be invested. What do you think the profile will look like as the economy recovers, employment improves and people's spending patterns change? And then I want to link that back into a number of questions is about is this reflected in the UK market, stock market? No. So we need to explore that. And we also need to look at possibly why has the US stock market done so much better than the UK market, what is it that investors here are missing in the, um, the, the presentation you've just given? Because it's very compelling on the numbers. Well, the, 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 let's, let's think about the composition of the markets. The, the, the Americans have got this sort of uh, concentration of tech stocks. I wouldn't put Bitcoin or Tesla into that category, but they've got the fangs. They've done rather well fundamentally. And our job in the UK is to capture some of that success a sales tax. There's no way that Amazon are going to leave the country when we start taxing them. They'll simply absorb it into their incredibly high uh, net margins. The problem with the UK is that much of this goes back to a point you made before. Large tracts of the UK have a property bias. And the narrative from journalists has been that we're going to end up having working from home as the new norm. And let me make one observation. Journalists are very good at telling you what's happening when they don't know what's happening. You think that, that consider the Schroders building, the Schroders building, that huge new building that Schroders occupy down by London Wall, it changed hands in the middle of the pandemic at a yield of 3.8%. Okay, no one's in it practically. Uh, my good mate Andy Bruff goes to work, but he's in a 
big, big temple. A global appetite. Uh, you ask a, a, any agent looking at, at uh, real estate in the UK, resi or, or commercial, the appetite to be an investor is huge. Ask an agent to find you floor space in London, City of London Prime. They'll say, can't find it. Uh, but only. And it, because the tech giants, they're still paying their rent. Let's, let's put it into context. Property rents are about less than ten, one tenth of a, a business firm's cost fraction. They can still pay rent even if they're workers at home. And at some point, very soon, those workers who are at home are going to return because that's the nature of competitive economies. You don't want to be at home. Management will start to uh, make uh, a very powerful impression that, that workers who are staying at home may need to reconsider their contracts, in terms of contracts, become consultants or uh, mm. not full-time employees. What are the consequences to uh, the access to credit? So I don't think working from home is anything other than a short-term issue. And we, just for disclosure, we, as a firm here, we've got a very sizable investment in IWG, formerly Regis. We've got a very significant affiliation with Regional REIT, which is a uh, an office business. So this is not mere conversation for us. We have skin in this game. Look, thank you very much, Neil. I'm sorry we've run out of time. There are more questions which we can probably handle another time. Thank you very much, Savas. Okay. Been terrific. Thank you. Just going to hand back to Keith. Thank you. Richard, Savas, thank you very much for that. That concludes the four presentations. I'd like to thank our speakers uh, and you, the audience, for attending this forum.